Every year, around two million dogs are consumed in South Korea. Most will originate from battery-run dog farms where puppies are born onto cold wire. Winters are harsh and the summers are contrastingly intense. They do not receive any love or a human hand to stroke their fur. They are pumped with antibiotics just to keep them alive long enough to take them away to the meat markets where they will be purchased, killed and consumed. They are dispatched in the most inhumane ways by hanging, beating and electrocution. However, change is in the air. The younger generations are rebelling against this age-old trade and shaming older family members into closing down their dog meat farms. Humane Society International is at the forefront of this exciting move and are assisting dog farmers on how to reinvent their lives and their businesses for good. Well, it's a very exciting day today. We're here outside the Animal Reception Centre at Heathrow Airport, where we're all eagerly awaiting the arrival of eight rescued dogs from the dog meat trade in Korea, rescued by charity Humane Society International after shutting down one of the biggest dog meat farms in Korea, consisting of over 200 dogs. These dogs have come all the way to the UK where they're going to be homed. We're going to be going over to All Dogs Matter later on, but we're going to meet them in a minute and we're going to have a chat and find out about their stories. Okay, we're here with Bridget, aren't we, Peter? We and she's one of the lucky ones to come to the UK. But of course, all 200 were rescued, which is amazing, Abs isn't it? Absolutely <laughs> magnificent. And thank you, HSI Global, and of course, HSI UK. It's a sensational, sensational rescue. 200 dogs um, from South Korea, all destined for the table, are now here <laughs> in England. Love. <laughs> Eight of them are here in England with us. and. Uh, Three of them will be going into a program uh, with medical detection and, and in order basically just to help show the South Korean people who want to eat dogs that there is a much better alter alternative and that is um, to have a dog that will help you save lives and help you in your life. Yeah, and that's amazing. Well, she's absolutely beautiful and of course what we were talking about earlier, weren't we, is how, how someone could actually go and look at an animal like this to actually pick it to take it home and eat it it's just you can't even think of that i mean dogs are so special yes. to the the british population they're so part of a family that it's very hard for us to understand sometimes yeah. another culture well I, I mean i have to say i mean it's, it's a thing of culture i, I don't think it's, it's a thing of cruelty really but there are so many um, South Koreans who feel exactly the same way as we do. It's a minority of people in South Korea that want to eat dog and it's very much within the old guard of people. <laughs> I think she's a bit, she wants to get going, she's had enough of this. Um, so uh, particularly the youth in South Korea, they have very much a Western attitude to animal welfare and they, are, they want to save their dogs and there are great charities in South Korea who are doing the same thing. Mm. It's very exciting and very, very, very mm. moving. So Peter, can you tell us a little bit more about what it was like to be on the Korean farm? Well, it, it was the most harrowing experience of my entire life. It was horrible. The first thing that hits you as you approach the farm is the deafening sound of dogs barking and yelping and crying for help, I suppose. Um, then once you kind of break through that and enter the farm, then the next thing which is so totally disgusting is the smell. And that smell is a combination of excrement, urine and ammonia. And that hits you through your nostrils and into your gut and it, you want to vomit, it is so disgusting. And then you walk around these facilities and you go from cage to cage and you see these remarkable dogs that all come to you. They, you put your hand to the cage, they come and lick your hand. They want 
human contact. They, they, dogs are, in, it is in their DNA to communicate with humans and it is so disgusting that that instinct is being destroyed by these dog meat farms mm. because they just want to eat them. I'm here with Roger Mugford and we've got a beautiful, beautiful rescue. What's this one called? This is PC or PC Etch, she's a lady. <laughs> uh, her predecessor was also called PC and oh. looked identical and he died sadly a year ago. Oh. And I'm missing him terribly and I saw her looking at me. I'm afraid I melted. Oh. And I'm, I'm, this is a very emotional day. Yes. Last week I left her in this cage and she looked at me and I cried leaving really? this farm. But um, big smiles today. When she sees Brit the PC, she'll melt. Are you actually going to adopt PC yourself yes, then? Yes, she, <gasps> she's coming home today. Oh my God, that's so, so exciting. exciting. And how many dogs do you have at home already? Four. Four. So um, you have to fit in, darling. Yeah. But, oh. um, <laughs> the, uh, but I think actually the transition is going to be quite easy. And of course, a small dogs are more easy to yes. find homes for and to adopt. But, yeah. um, but the dog in your hand, I think, has a great potential. Yes. And uh, this Bridget um, is a beautiful dog. And the, characteristically, all of the dogs we saw <laughs> are beautiful dogs. Um, yes. And, and uh, physically beautiful and emotionally beautiful. Yes. And uh, it's such a <laughs> an, an puzzle to we Westerners how anybody could treat any animal, yeah. not just the fact that they're dogs, any animal in the way that these dogs have been treated. Yeah. And when you saw her out in Korea, was she crushed in a cage? Did she have any room? No, there were six dogs, so she was number six. Um, and when I lifted her out and spoiled her as, as one does, put her back, she was immediately attacked by one other wow. of the other five. Um, and it's just so sad. These dogs have no personal space, of course, no toys no normal human food. They don't have water. They're, they're, so, they're kept without water. So how do they get on? They're, do they get it wet from food. that? <laughs> yeah, I'm getting pulled by Bridget here. Slop food. So literally they get their moisture from the slop from that the, they're dished out. That's it, that's it. So these, this little dog, these dogs have to learn everything from scratch. Um, they have to learn about human beings, that we're nice guys, hopefully, um, mm. that uh, human beings are a source of love as well as just food and um, they have to learn our language, learn our smells, learn our facial expressions. The, the, the farmer that was that actually kept these dogs, did you did you see, was it a him or a her? It was a her. And did you did you see her stroking or touching Never. any of the dogs? They, they are given no normal human affection. Well, They're I, not let out of these cages ever. I um, think it's astounding because they're so well behaved for having that lack yeah, yeah. of well, human contact. We obviously have selected eight dogs that will make this journey and hopefully make this transition to living as pets or as working dogs indeed. Yeah. Okay, well I wish you all the luck. I, I think we're going to be great and oh, she loves yeah. you. Once the dogs were checked out of the animal centre, they were off on the next part of their exciting adventure to All Dogs Matter in North London, where they would be assessed, treated for any medical issues, rehabilitated and eventually adopted out to new loving families. I'm here with Claire Bass from Humane Society International. We've got Coco, who's one of the little ones, haven't we? Which is quite surprising. It's like, beggars the, the, the question, how can people eat dogs so small? Well, um, I have no answer for that, Annika, I'm afraid. But yeah, this is, this is one of the eight dogs uh, we've brought to the UK um, for rehoming. Um, in, and it's part of our campaign to end the dog meat trade in South Korea. So these dogs are from the sixth farm that we've closed in South Korea. We've rescued uh, over 700 dogs so far from those six farms. They've all been uh, rehomed into loving family homes. Um, and really, they're, part of the campaign is to show that these dogs are just dogs. They're, they're not meat dogs. Mm. Um, they can be loving companions. And uh, we are also really highlighting the fact to the Korean government that many farmers want to leave this trade. It's not mm. profitable. It's a marginal 
uh, food, um, it's a dying industry basically and so by showing that farmers are willing to close, um, cooperate rather than have conflict, we hope that's a model the government mm. can take forward and uh, adopt a full on yeah. phase out. So the, the farmers, do they actually come to you or do you approach them? Yep, so far of all six farms that we've closed, the farmers are, are basically queuing up because there's a lot of shame for many of the farmers attached to the industry because the cruelty is fairly apparent, you know, and these dogs just want to be cuddled and, and loved, as you can see. Yeah. And so when they're treated so badly, it's, you know, the families of the farmers often are urging them to get out of business. Yes, yeah. so, well, that, that's quite encouraging because it's showing younger generations have definitely got a, a different state of mind to the older generations. So if it's coming from the, the younger ones, encouraging their relatives Absolutely. to give it up, I think that's a really good sign of the times. It is, yeah. And when we're also really encouraged by the fact that this campaign is really coming from Korea. It's being driven by you know, the younger generation in Korea particularly who want to see an end to this trade. And that's also having an impact on political opinions as well. There's 50 or more politicians in, in mm. Korea who are vocally opposed to the cruelty inherent to the dog meat trade. So you know, change is happening. Um, we hope that with the Olympic Games, the Winter Olympics in 2018, we can use that as a catalyst to make the change happen even faster. Yes. So that people remember the Winter Olympics for all the right reasons. You know, if they phase out the dog meat trade, then, you know, mm. it, won't be, it won't be tarred with that awful image. How many other farms do you think you might be able to tackle by the end of 2017? Well, that's, that's a difficult um, question to answer. I and mean, we're, we're pushing the government, as I mentioned, to adopt uh, to commit to a phase-out strategy because there's 17,000 or so farms in South Korea ranging in size from a few tens of dogs to more than a thousand. So we as a charity can't go around and close every single one. Yeah. We're using this as a model to show the government you know, what they should commit to. Um, but, you know, as I said, we've already got another farm, you know, wanting to work with us and I'm sure there'll be more very okay. soon. So for the, for the government to help farmers get out of the industry, what are you asking them to do to, to give them some money to help them set up a different business? Yeah, so what we've been doing with the farms that we've closed so far is helping them transition to an alternative livelihood. Uh, so in some cases it's blueberry farming, other types of arable farming, never animal farming. That's the only condition um, yeah. of the agreement with them. Um, and so, yes, we, we basically tear down all the cages, um, work with them to create whatever, you know, um, farming system mm -hmm. they need, if it's greenhouses for blueberry farming. Uh, and then, you know, they, they have that sort of startup that they need to move on mm. and leave dog farming behind. Yeah, and definitely I think it would be very good for Korea to actually be seen as the ones phasing it out eventually. Um, because I think um, there, there is a lot of xenophobia. We've seen it on websites and we're also very much aware that it's only a very small pocket of people in Korea that are actually engaged in, in this practice. But I think the rest of the world do tend to think that it is the whole country. So I think for Korea to actually step forward forward and actually phase out themselves we give them such incredible positivity and um, show the world that they are actually working towards phasing it out before the Winter Olympics. Yep, we hope so. Yes, fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> um, do, you, do you think these dogs were born on the farm or do you think they were handed in perhaps by people that didn't want the pets? It's hard to say but I mean I, all, I can, all I can say is that the way that she is she's just so relaxed being held it is possible that she was a dumped pet. Um, mm. That does happen. Most of the dogs are bred on the farm, but it is possible that this one actually has, at some point, been loved by somebody, but then was unfortunate enough to be abandoned um, mm. and then ended up on a dog meat farm. Mm. And this, this farm is quite big. I mean, 200 dogs is a lot, yeah. but I've heard that they can go up to, what, 2,000 dogs? Or? Yeah, you could, I mean, they're all shapes and sizes. So you can have uh, dog meat farms that have got 30 or so dogs, um, 2,000 is probably, you know, on the on the large side. Well, it's a massive, um, it's like a chicken farm almost. I mean, yeah. sh surely when you get that amount of dogs, the, the, the standards would plummet even worse than they would be at 200. It's kind of um, like just the archetypal factory farm. Uh, just uh, cage after cage after cage of dogs circling in panic um, with absolutely no environmental enrichment. They get fed uh, slop once a day usually no water whatsoever. Yeah, I was told that, that they get no water at all and it, it purely comes from this porridge-like. Yep. Um, what is in that food, do you know, that goes in the slop? It doesn't bear thinking about all sorts. I mean, I've seen them being fed just uh, chicken feet. 
um, you've seen bits of bits of animal, bits of cereal, um, usually peelings from restaurants, anything that is really, really cheap. Because one thing about dog meat farming is that you know every corner is cut so that you can make as much mm. profit as possible. Okay. And what are what are the regulations in Korea um, for the, the the dog meat farms? Do they have any regulations at all? No, that it's can... not. It's not regulated, um, which is why it kind of falls in between the tracks it's kind of in legal limbo it's not explicitly legal but it's not explicitly illegal either although many of the component parts of the dog meat trade are illegal for example it's illegal to kill an animal in front of animals of the same species it's illegal to uh, kill an animal by hanging by the neck but those are things that are routinely happening in the dog meat trade mm. in south korea yeah, well, there's certainly been footage, hasn't there, on the internet. Yeah. Um, some people were suggesting that the hanging is something they used to do and they don't do that so, mu so much anymore. Would you agree it, with that? It does still happen. I mean, certainly electrocution is the most common way of killing them, but hanging does definitely still happen. Um, and sometimes hanging and beating is in that, combination. Is that for the reasons bef that we discussed before, that it was to increase the adrenaline of the dog, that the dog needs to suffer? When, when it's dying? I, I can only talk from personal experience and I've not come across that belief in South Korea. In other parts of Asia, yes. Um, but in South Korea, I've not come across that. Um, but there's no two ways about it. I mean, the, the, the killing methods are utterly brutal. And with electrocution, mm. um, you know, normally it takes between about two and five minutes to die. But there have been cases where 10, 20 minutes until death. God, that seems ridiculous. It's mm. not quick at all. No. And um, so we've got eight dogs which have come yes. to the UK, which is brilliant. Yeah. And all the others, are they going to America? Uh, America and Canada. OK. Yeah. Um, so some of them are already uh, arrived um, and then the last lot are ready to go. And then once that's done and every cage is empty, we'll then dismantle oh. all the cages and the How farm exciting. will be uh, over, yeah. closed. Um, and that business will be be finished. Um, the farmer hasn't completely made her mind up about what she's going to carry on and do. She's talked about moving to the city um, yeah. and maybe opening up a shop. Um, but for her, certainly, she's very keen to leave mm. the dog meat trade behind her. Mm. Does she feel good about closing down her very farm? Very good. Yeah. I mean, she's when you talk to her, uh, you get a very definite sense of shame and regret oh. um, and that's a common theme actually with all the dog farmers that we've worked with yeah. they are under a lot of pressure particularly from family particularly if they've got kids themselves to get out of the dog meat mm. trade and in working with us because we spend months on these farms with the farmers we have to go back and do vaccinations and deworming and getting mm. them prepared for their journey and so we get to know the farmers really well and they come on a journey an emotional journey with us yeah. um, we've had dog meat farmers who when the last dog is leaving they've been in tears and oh I my think gosh those emotions it's a mixture of of regret and and shame because they've seen how we interact with those dogs yeah. when hsi turns up suddenly those dogs get cuddles and kisses oh. and so I think everybody learns a lot. Well, today has been an extremely positive day. I've enjoyed myself so much meeting all of the lucky rescues that have come over to England. And I think it's so interesting to actually see how far Korea has come in actually bringing the dog meat trade to an end. I'm feeling really rather hopeful about this. We've got 2017 as a last chance to bring it to the end before the Winter Olympics. I think there might be a chance.